Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Welcome to our visitors. And if if you are a sinner, you are welcome here. And if you're not a sinner, you're more than welcome here. Because (laughs) you're lying and now you are a sinner. So we, uh, just a few announcements. One, that just keep Pastor and his family in prayer as he considers the call. He'll be going for an interview next next week. So just uh, keep them in prayer as you as he goes through the process that God will uh, provide him an answer in, in what he should should do. So we wait for that as well. So and on the back, if you look on the back of your bulletin, I was pointed out that this was written by Miss Emily Kregel. So read that if you get a chance to, but not during the service. Okay, so I'm going to start off with, uh, we have an enemy who wants to rob, steal, kill, and destroy. He works overtime to rob our confidence and steal our passion. He is a liar and accuser. His name is Satan. However, God has given us weapons that we can use in warfare when Satan is hounding us. We can clobber the enemy with the word of God and praise. These two weapons, when combined, will crush him under your feet. Here's the thing. Satan is allergic to praise. When you feel him trying to defeat you or steal your confidence, start praising the name of Jesus Christ. As you exalt Jesus Christ for who he is, Satan will run like a coward. This principle is seen in the story of Jehoshaphat leading the troops of Judah out to fight the enemies that were surrounding them. Instead of sending out the troops first, King Jehoshaphat sent out choirs to who sang, Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. As the choir sang, the Lord sent ambushes against the enemies, and all were defeated. It is a powerful story illustrating how praising God defeats the enemy in our lives. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we exalt you, because with your help, we can get through any situation that feels insurmountable. By your power, darkness turns to light. Thank you that when we feel fear, your presence is with us. We praise you that you promise to lead us in victory as we trust in you. Father God, I thank you that through Christ we have victory in every situation. No weapon formed against me will prosper. We will praise you, Lord Jesus, that today we can stand in your victory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Two and four. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Let's stand and do as Tracy said. Let's exalt our God and shoo Satan away. He is exalted 726 in the blue spiral.
Let us bow before the Lord and confess our sins. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. From Psalm 32, verse 5, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. It is because of promises like this, in the word of God and from the mouth of God himself, and because of the completed work of Christ on the cross in your place, I can declare to you that your sins have been forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. We'll call on the scripture reader at this time. First reading is from Acts chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying. And in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift, to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. The epistle lesson is from Revelation chapter 21, 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Here ends the readings. Please rise for the reading of the gospel text. 
The gospel text today comes from John chapter 13. It's verses 1 through 5. It is also the message text today, reading in Jesus' name. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet little while I am with you, you will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved, if you have love for one another. Here ends the reading. Let us now confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll call on the children at this time for the children's message. Braxton, did you bring it? Woo! All right. Nice. Is Spider-Man your favorite? Spider-Man's pretty good. My favorite's Batman, but we'll let you have Spider-Man, okay? Which Spider-Man is your favorite? Which one do you know? Which one? The, did he say the black one? Venom? No. Oh, no, 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 okay. I was thinking... I was thinking Venom, and then he got me excited because I like Venom too, but okay. All right. Oh. All right. Yeah, this is fun, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> yep. So, what do you recognize? Well, what is this, first of all, guys? It's, everybody knows what it is, right? It's bubbles. Now, we can, we can take this out, and it would be the big kind of one, right? So, this could make big bubbles, but then on the end, there's even a little one too. That's kind of fun. What do you recognize about this? Okay, it's red. What else? Yeah, it's bubbles in it. What else? Anything particular? It's important. Oh, well, it's long. That's not it. What do you think? It's not safe to drink. Oh, that's true. It's not safe to drink. Yeah, you get an upset tummy if you drink bubble water. What else? There's something particular about this one. It's red like a heart. It's red like a heart. Yep, that's not it, though. What is it? Um, it's, um, it's shaped like a two. It is shaped like a two, but that's not it. Let's let Levi try before West or Isaiah takes it. Uh, it is like one thing. No. Well, yeah, it's got, it tells us who it's made from and stuff, but that's not it. It hasn't been opened yet. It has not been opened yet. This has not been opened yet. Now, how fun is this? This is a lot of fun, isn't it? But it's not fun unless we open it, is it? Yeah. So, you know, God gives us a gift of faith, right? God gives us a free gift. You know, like if I were to give this away, can I give this away, Braxton? Okay. Thanks anyway, though, right? So God gives us a free gift, but you know what? If we don't open it, what good is it? And opening it, all that means is that we're receiving the gift. How many of you on Christmas morning do not open your gifts? No, yeah, that's right. What say what say what did you say? Say it loud. I would never even You you yeah, oh, okay, so she says, I would not even open not even one of them. I open them all, all of them. <laughs> all of them, yes. So when Christ gives us and grants us the gift of salvation, 
when he, when he gives, them, gives us of himself, it would mean nothing if we don't receive it for ourselves, right? We have to receive that. We can reject the truth of Scripture. We can reject the gift of God. And, and we do that by what? When we, how do we receive? There's one thing we do, and that's it that counts. One thing. What is it? Nope. That, that's a great thing we have, but that is a secondary means of grace. What do we do? We believe. We believe. So, this is fun, but if I tell you it's fun, it doesn't mean anything. But if you open it, and then you play with it, you know that it's fun. Right? So we can know how good God is by receiving and believing in him today. So the next time you're outside and you're playing with bubbles, remember, you know what? I'm grateful that I get to believe in God and that I can have faith in him. Pretty good. Good job, Braxton. That was a great one. All right. Thank you, sir. Hands out. Hands together. Dear Heavenly Lord, thank you so much for uh, the gift of love that you give to us, the gift of faith, the gift of believing. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you continue to help us to walk and to believe. Help us to continue to stay close and near to you. Draw us unto yourself. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. In your holy name, amen. All right. Who? L? L. Is that what you said, right? Okay. I, I keep hearing you say Kel, and I was like, I don't think we have Kel, but L, you're next, okay? All right, go have a seat, guys. You had bubbles for Easter? This song is found in the blue um, hymnal, number 191, This Is My Father's World.
The message text today comes from John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. I would ask that you would pray with me as we begin. Dear Lord, we turn to you for understanding, Jesus. We turn to you for your word today. We ask that you would speak to us. Lord, if if you do not speak, then everything falls short. If it is not you who, who reaches to us, that draws us unto you, then, then we, would be, we would be lost, Lord. So in this time, Lord Jesus, would you please lift up the weary sinner. Send your gospel message, Lord, to those of faint of heart. Encourage each and every soul. May no distraction or no thing, no thing get in the way. May your word accomplish its task. Your will be done, and you be glorified in this time. By your precious name, Jesus, amen. The passage of scripture I'm pretty sure I've preached on before here. I can't remember specifically uh, what was said and what was spoken on, but I know we've talked about this often and over and over and over again. The thing that we're reading from really draws together underneath verse 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. That is, a, I guess, a a question that we may ask of ourselves often. Do people know that we believe? When people see us, do they see Christ? Am I accomplishing what God wills for me in my life as I live my life out among men? The first thing I want to do before we begin to really grasp and dig into what is being said here and and to notice different things, we need to put it underneath the umbrella and in its proper place that we should understand it. And what I mean by that is that we properly need to divide the word of truth. We properly need to understand what is being spoken of here. Notice this specifically. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. This passage of scripture, speaking to love, is not speaking to justification. It's speaking to sanctification. And that's important. Because we will all recognize that we don't always love as we should. But when we don't love as we should, does that mean that I'm not a believer? Do you understand what I'm saying then? Right? We must understand that that what we're speaking of here is not justification, my rightness before God, but my sanctification, which is my rightness before men. And that's important. Because often what we do when we think of the difference is when we take justification and insert it where sanctification is happening, we often then think that because of what I'm doing, then I am not a believer. While love is an attribute of a believer, it doesn't make the believer. So if you are a confirmation student, <clears throat> Isaiah, what is it that makes a believer? What, what does it mean to believe? I'm making it too difficult. What makes you a Christian? Believing in Christ. That's right. So I'm picking on Isaiah for a specific reason. I didn't ask him if I could do this. But most recently, somebody questioned some behavior that Isaiah had been doing. Isaiah, your behavior wasn't exactly, I bet I was going to use a specific word, but I can't pronounce it right now. Christian-like, was it? Isaiah, was it? Did it reflect the character of a believer? Did you act like a Christian? No. And the person wondered, does Isaiah even believe? That was the question that was asked. Have you ever acted in a way of unbelief? Have you ever acted like you weren't a Christian? 
Has something you've done looked and made you look like you weren't a believer? I can guarantee that Isaiah is not the only one that has ever done this. In fact, if we're honest, we all do it more often than we shouldn't, more than likely. But is that what makes you a believer? There is one thing and one thing alone that makes you a believer and one thing and one thing alone that discredits you as a believer. And that is belief. If you believe, you are saved. If you disbelieve, you are condemned. This is John chapter 3, verse 18. If you don't believe, you are condemned already because you did not believe in the only Son of God, Jesus Christ. That's what makes you a believer or not a believer. That's justification. However, how my life is lived out among people and the process of living out my faith, which happens over time, which I grow in as Christ lives in and through me, as Christ changes me, as the Holy Spirit leads and guides me, and I listen more closely to his voice, that changes me and my behavior. So we're not talking about just simple behavior modification because it takes belief. But we're also saying that it's not by your works that you are saved. But we cannot deny these truths that we find in verse 34 and 35. So first of all, we recognize that this is an act of sanctification, something that happens over time, a process that God works in me, that I grow in, something that's not immediate, and something that doesn't say that I'm a believer, but it can verify that I am because it's an attribute. So that's the second part. Number two is that love, as a characteristic of a Christian, is a primary attribute. A primary attribute. In fact, it's the fruit of the Spirit. How many of you try to love your neighbor, but you're terrible at it? I've got several neighbors that I, that I have a hard time loving. But guess what? If I try to do it in on myself, I'm never going to do it. It's never going to happen. Not, not loving the way that God wants me to love because it's a fruit of the Spirit. And if I'm not walking in the Spirit, I cannot love the way I'm supposed to love because it's a fruit of the Spirit. If I'm not a believer, it's hard for me to love. It's a fruit of the spirits, and it's the first fruit listed. The first fruit. So, it is a primary attribute of a believer. So this is a few things we're going to note about that. Number one, how do you know an apple is an apple? Anybody? Well, it came from an apple tree, but if I were to put it into a thing of oranges, how would I know the difference? We, we almost sound like that's a stupid question, don't we, as we say it? Well, duh. It's going to be the one that's completely different. It's red and not orange. So there's a primary characteristic of fruit. I mean, how do you know an apple from a banana? Anybody ever accidentally ate a banana when they were looking for an apple? Kind of hard, isn't it? It's a primary attribute. In fact, they are so characteristic of what it is, you can know what it is right away. That is what love is supposed to be for a Christian. It's a primary attribute. It should stand out like a sore thumb, right? Like you put it in, it's like a light in the dark. It, you know, it, it, it should stick out in contrast against the world. By this, all men will know that you are my disciple. So as, as a disciple of Jesus, as a Christian, as a follower, as a believer of Christ, the, the thing that we should first see out of everybody and should be the thing that tells us and tells us who we are among everything else is love. It's love. When we think of that, maybe... You're like me. And as you were growing up, what love is supposed to be, 
what it should look like. The riches of what God wants for you in your life, maybe you didn't have that, right? How is it that a mother who may never know what love is can show motherly love? Luther tried to help explain that to us by teaching us how God works in vocation. I'm telling you this because maybe you don't know what you're supposed to do to love others. As a natural attribute, it should be something that flows from us, but sometimes maybe that characteristic is so abnormal from what we were originally in our life that we don't understand what it looks like every day. And so maybe we don't seek it out. Because the truth is, love, as we look at it finally here, love is a choice. So what we see here is a, we, we recognize that as Jesus is talking about this, that, that it's sanctification, that God works in, it, in me and through me, and that, that he guides and leads me, and I get better at it over time. And it's a primary attribute, something that if it's absent of my life, I could wonder, am I a Christian at all? But it's not what makes me a believer, but it should be present. And yet we recognize that it's consciously chosen. No greater love has anyone than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. That means love is absolutely selfish, selfless and not selfish. And so therefore, this is one reason why it contrasts the world. Because if we were to think of the world, what do we see in the world? If you were to say, what is the common characteristic of the world, what is it? You do you, and I'll do me, right? You only live once, right? All of it is about self. You can't love others till you love yourself first. Pfft, really? I can choose to love others whether I love myself or not. I don't have to love myself to love others. In fact, it has nothing to do with me if I love somebody else. Because I'm being selfless to them. So that really is removing myself altogether. So I have no part in loving somebody else. In fact, if I'm putting myself in any part of loving somebody else, in some way, I'm not really fully loving them to the extent that I should. Because I'm doing it for self. So I don't need to have myself involved at all. In the world, it's all about self. Self first. Have it your way. Get it right now. So when love really comes into play in the world, it's a super contrast, isn't it? And that's what we should be. We should be a contrast to everything around us because we're not about ourselves. We're about others. And because love is a choice, I can learn how to make good choices, can't I? I can make bad choices all my life. I can have a tendency to do things wrong my whole life. But I can still choose to love. And I can still change the course of my decisions. And so I can always be better at being a Christian because I can always choose a different way. I can choose to love. That's in contrast to what the world would tell you love is today anyway, isn't it? That alone is different than what the world would say. So every day we must choose to love against all odds. If you were to think of mainstream Christianity today in the world, what are Christians known for? What are Christians known for? I'd be interested for you to tell me what you think they are. I mean, I, have, I believe I know what they are, but that doesn't mean that I have a definitive list or that my ideas are the best, but does anybody want to think and say what they think the Christians are most known for in the world today? What would you say? Anybody? Missions? 
Social justice. Social justice. Yeah, social justice. What else? How about the morals we try to stand on, right? Fighting against abortion. We can make a list now, just by stating those two things or three things, we can make, make a list of the primary things that if the world were to look out and say, oh, that person's a Christian. Oh, that's a Christian. Oh, that's a Christian. They would know that because of these things that we are fighting against and fighting for, right? Right? And we claim they're for love. But the way we do it matters. Because sometimes we stand on a moral unlovingly. What purpose does that serve? To say we're a Christian, to stand on a Christian moral, but then to deny the very primary attribute that God says we should be known by, and that is love. Isn't that counterproductive? Maybe, sometimes, it's because we're not really a believer and we're trying to act like a believer. And we think by acting like a believer, we're a believer. When the reality is, you must be a believer first. We are to be known by our love. How we say what we say and the way we do what we do matters. It absolutely matters. Because if we act without love, maybe we can wonder if we're acting as God wants us to act. Even if we think we're acting on a moral that we should stand on. Do we as Christians cause more harm by what we're saying and what we're doing because we're not doing it from a place of the Holy Spirit leading us where the fruit of the Spirit that leads us is love. Is this possible? It can be, yeah. We cannot stand on Christian morals if we first do not love. So today what I would ask is that we would recognize what's being said here. We recognize that God desires first and foremost this thing in our life, love. Love above all things else. And if we don't have love, then we don't have God. If we have God, we can love. But he has to do it in and through us, and we have to choose to follow and do. Faithful is he who calls, will do it. So it's possible, and we can choose it. But first we have to choose God, right? As he is living in through us, we submit to him, we receive from him, and we obey. And that doesn't mean that we will be perfect in loving. That's the point I began with. It's sanctification. We get better at it over time. And we shouldn't have it define if we are a believer. Our belief defines if we are a believer. But most certainly, love should be present in what we do and what we say. Let us pray. Jesus, put that in us, a heart of love. Lead and guide it, and it may it be the thing in our life that defines us. You defining who we are and then living in and through us the characteristics of the fruits of the Spirit because your Spirit lives within us. That it longs to get out and break out from out around us to the people around us. You long to choose to use us. And so we long to be used. Let us not be foolish, but wise. Let us stand on you and may love abound, Lord. That they would know that we are your disciples. That that would be what Christians are known for is love. Teach us to be solid and stable. Love others as you have loved us. Lord, we can't do this without you. We need you so desperately. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. In your precious name, amen.
The song As the Deer can be found in the Blue Spiral 705. Please join. Jesus, we come before you. We're thankful for this altar, for this place that we can come and know that you meet us here. Thank you for this congregation that you have established by your word and spirit, each and every believer, Lord God, that you've gathered together in this place and afar as we join the body of believers as we become heirs to the promise. Thankful we get to be counted among saints. Even though we look at ourselves and all we see are the flaws, Lord Jesus, we're thankful that when you see us, you see the precious blood of Christ. You don't see our imperfections, but you see the victory of the cross. We are thankful for that today. We ask, Lord Jesus, as you would be with those who are in need of healing. Lord, be with those who are shut in. Be with Juanita. Elaine, Joanne, thank you for the recent uh, positive reports, Lord, of Rick and his cancer and and the positive 
places that he has been coming through from that. We pray for Tim. Pray for Delbert this morning, Lord. We ask that you would be with him. We pray, Lord Jesus, you would be with those on our cradle roll. Be with all the children of this congregation. And in that way also too, Lord Jesus, be with the VBS team. Be with the team from Bible school that's going to go out and to, to minister to the children of our association, including this very congregation. Prepare the hearts of those who will do the work and prepare the hearts of those who are going to attend. May it be, Lord Jesus, that you are glorified, that we are filled because of it. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for Jessica and Jason's wedding and for their family. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bless them. Thank you for the gift of marriage. We pray, Lord God, that you would protect this nation, this community, this congregation, and family. Protect those, Lord Jesus, who have come together unto your name that are defined by you. And do not let Satan have his way against any of them. Protect each and every one. Lord Jesus, there are many things that, that we can ask for, many things that we need and, and know. We don't want to come to you just as a, as a genie in a bottle asking for things, Lord, but there is no other help. There is no other way. There is no other mediator between us and God but you. So we trust in you and everything you've taught us, and we pray then the way you've taught us as well. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please rise, receive the benediction. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, and invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing together our closing hymn, I Exalt Thee, number 842 in the songbook.